So next week we'll get back into our series on drugs and uh, what the Bible has to say about it and what's going on in the world in the context of the end times. Uh, but this week I want to uh, do a message, and this beats on my heart every so often, especially as a pastor. Uh, are you truly saved? I know Pastor Steve and I, that's probably one of the biggest concerns that we have is, as we pass this fellowship together is wanting to make sure the people that are here are saved. We want to witness the lost and make sure they get saved and come to Christ. But we want to make sure that people know Jesus who walk in this door, who, who are part of our fellowship. Uh, I don't want to be one of those pastors that stands before God uh, because each pastor... According to Hebrews 13, it says to obey your leaders because they will give an account for your souls. Each pastor will give an account for the souls that he ministers to. And I don't want to be one of those pastors of some kind of mega church where uh, people are brought in just to fill the seats and to pay the bills and, and so forth. And uh, where they're never taught repentance. They're not warned that they won't inherit the kingdom of God if they refuse to repent and and they're not told about hell and they're not told about the blood of christ and they're not told about what saving faith really is and and there's gonna be millions of people many jesus said who will say on that day lord lord as though they knew him and he'll depart say depart from me i never knew you and that's a that's a scary prospect for a lot of people and because i fear the lord and i love the lord I want to give it a good, a good account and bring forth what he has revealed in his word. Because I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, because I love you, I dare not ever make you think that you're right with God if you're not. And it's incumbent upon a true preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be faithful, a faithful steward to what God has revealed to us, amen, in his word. And... It's serious stuff. Paul was able to say in Acts chapter 20 that I'm free from the blood of all men. And by saying that, he was saying that there's nobody's blood on my hands. There's nobody going to hell because I didn't preach the gospel to them. In fact, in that context in Acts 20, he says, I did not shrink back from declaring to the whole or entire counsel of God. In that same chapter, he talks about how he preached repentance. That's missing a lot of messages today with a lot of preachers. Rick Warren says he doesn't use the word repentance. If you hold your breath or you don't drink water until you hear Joel Olstein use the word repentance, you'll dehydrate. Okay? And this is really scary, folks, because a lot of people have a false understanding of what true conversion means. And the name of this message is, Are You Truly Saved? For Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The last thing I want to happen to you when you die and when you give an account for your life is to be under the delusion that you're saved if you're not. You want to make sure you're truly trusting Jesus. And, and that's why every once in a while I kind of meditate on this little passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's turn there, verses 5 through 7. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 7. And if you're, if you're saying, hey, I'm trusting Jesus, I know I'm trusting Jesus. You know, he, he's first in my life and, you know, he's the object of my faith and, you know, and there's fruit in my life. And uh, praise God. This still will pertain to you because it's, there's many, there's verses here that we look at that should just explode off the page. You should know this. You should not only know this, this doctrine that I'm going to share with you, the scriptures that I'm going to share with you, you should be able to share these with others. And most Christians don't even know what I'm talking about when I go through these next verses. They've never even heard the Greek word that I'm going to talk about. They're not conversant with the passages, many of which I will talk about. But we should not only be knowing these things, we should, not for our salvation, but for the sake of just being good stewards of God's word. If you've been Christian a number of years, you should be able to share these truths with others. And I want to not just encourage you to make sure, hey, you know, we're following the Lord, we're right with him, but also to encourage you to encourage people outside our fellowship. And there's many people like this who even go to church on Sundays, but their hearts are far from the Lord. Jesus warned about there'd be many who, you know, draw to, to him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. He has to have our hearts. Amen. 
Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, very interesting. Paul says, test yourselves. We're supposed to test ourselves. Did you know that? The Bible says to test yourself. Test yourselves to see if test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. You're supposed to test yourself to say, hey, hey, I'm really in the faith. Am I really trusting Jesus? Examine yourselves. There it is again. There's two times within one verse we're called to test or examine ourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Jesus lives in you, unless you fail the test. So you're supposed to test yourself, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith, and Jesus is in you unless you fail the test as to whether or not you are in the faith. The Bible says, you know, that in Romans chapter 8, a believer is defined as being led by the Spirit in that chapter. And, and uh, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, it says you are none of His. Or you don't, that's King James, you don't belong to Him. Does Jesus live in us? And he, he asks this question, it's interesting. Look at verse 6. But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Paul's ministry was under question by the Corinthians. And when you read 2 Corinthians, it's his most defensive letter defending his ministry because Satan is using false apostles and wicked people to try to heap uh, dispersion upon Paul's ministry. And that old saying, touch not the Lord's anointed, is often take, taken out of context, but you can apply that to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> God was using him, and people were... Uh, now, all true believers have the anointing of God. And sometimes false teachers use that phrase, touch not the Lord's anointed, to protect their ministries and to protect uh, their false ministries. I'm talking about false ministers, you know. But Paul was a radical man of God, and he was under uh, attack from Satan, and Satan uses people to try to destroy the work he was doing. You've got to be really careful, you know, with something like that. And Paul is on the defense, and he knows that they haven't failed the test, him and his ministry team. And in verse 7, now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. So he wants to make sure they are in the faith. He turns the table on them and says, hey, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Christ is in you unless you fail the test. Now understand, this problem goes back to... the. The letter uh, before this, which is really the second letter written to the Corinthians, this is the third. First Corinthians, the very first Corinthians, we don't have because God did not seek to inspire it as a, a book of the Bible. But we know in Paul's letter what that we call first Corinthians, he references that letter. But God used him to bring correction by his Holy Spirit and bring forth scripture. And then second Corinthians, which was his third letter to the Corinthians, he writes to them again. But in 1 Corinthians, there were a lot of serious problems. They had false wisdom they were leaning upon in the first few chapters. You can see that. Uh, they were uh, involved in all kinds of wickedness. Uh, in fact, they were even approving of wickedness of a man having sexual relations with his, his father's wife, Paul says. And then they were defrauding each other and suing each other, chapter 6. And... He goes, I mean, they were doing a lot of things. We don't have time to get into misuse of the gifts, 1 Corinthians 14. You remember, they're all speaking in tongues at once without an interpreter, you know. And then in chapter 15, some were denying the resurrection of Christ. Those are some serious problems in that church, amen? So Paul's like correcting those things. And then in 2 Corinthians, he rejoices that some of those things have been corrected. But when he gets to certain parts in 2 Corinthians, he's also concerned that many of them are still being deceived in areas. In chapter 11, right be two chapters before this, that's where he says that he wants to present them as a chaste virgin to Jesus. But he fears that by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so their minds would be corrupted from their simple devotion to Christ and that they would believe in a different gospel, receive a di believe in a different Jesus, receive a different spirit. They'd fall for it. For Satan comes the angel of light and he doesn't want them to be deceived. But he's also concerned that after warning them about those who would not inherit the kingdom of God, drunkards and fornicators and adulterers and revilers and extortioners and thieves and all these things he lists in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. He's concerned and he warns them, don't be deceived. 
Those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God, or the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now he's concerned that some of them still have not repented. So he asked them to examine themselves and see if they're in the faith. How do I know that? Back up a few verses. Back up. Verse 21. Remember, there's no chapter break. So you're just backing up a few, a couple, you know, a paragraph or so in his original letter, or 2 Corinthians, I mean this letter, I should say. Verse 21, I'm afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not what? Repented of the impurity, immorality, and sensuality which they have what? Practiced. Woo! And Paul's the one in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 21. I'm sorry, Galatians 5, 19 through 21 where he talks about the works of the flesh. And he says, you know for certain, as I told you before, I tell you again, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we're not talking about someone falling short and getting right with God. We're talking about someone who adopts a wicked lifestyle of rebellion against God. And he says, I'm going to be humiliated because I'm going to have to mourn. Mourn meaning I'm going to bawl, I'm going to weep. It's a word used for what happens at funerals when someone dies. And he's going to be dying over spiritual death in the camp. And it breaks his heart that there are going to be some there that even though they have the truth, they'll still be there, but they're walking in rebellion. They're still involved in, uh, you know, heinous sin. So he says in verse 5, test yourselves, at 13, to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. He's concerned that there are going to be people who think that Jesus is in them, even though they're in rebellion to the Lord. And they continued in that rebellion. They refused to repent in the face of correction. In the Old Testament, it talks about a believer. And it says the Lord left him, but he did not know it. Wow. And he doesn't want us to be under this delusion. And you know, pastors don't like to talk about this because the other extreme is we don't want believers constantly fearful that they're not saved. But if you don't talk about these things, you're going to have under, all kinds of people under the delusion, if you're not preaching correctly, biblically, under the delusion that they're saved when they're on their way to hell, and that's an eternal reality for them. I could not dare not speak on these issues. In fact, the strongest warnings in the New Testament, as far as, I should say, many of the strongest warnings in the New Testament in regard to making sure you're saved is in 1 John. Some of those radical warnings about making sure you're following the lord you know what john writes in first john chapter 5 verse 13 these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life he wants us to know that we have eternal life but he doesn't just pat them on the back and say hey, everything's cool you know as long as you went up the altar one time years ago and accepted jesus in your heart you're saved you gotta say that he emphasizes faith in christ but he also tells us what faith he tells us what faith looks like Amen? Read 1 John. It's a trip. And we'll probably look at 1 John a little bit today. So we're called to examine ourselves. Now it's interesting, in verse 5 when he says, Christ is in you unless you fail the test. Fail the test is three English words in, our, in the New American Standard Bible. But they come, now listen, you, this is, you want to catch this because if you miss this little point, you're not going to be able to appreciate some of what's to come. The words fail the test come from one Greek word. I taught this about this word probably 25 plus years ago. I talked about this Greek word. And the Greek word is adakamas. Remember, some of you remember that. Adakamas, very important word, only years, used eight times in the New Testament. Use three of the eight times right here. One in verse, once in verse 5, once in verse 6, once in verse 7. Three of the eight times. Every time by the Apostle Paul. Except for its usage in Hebrews. And some would argue that that's by Paul too because they believe Paul wrote Hebrews. Nevertheless, it's used eight times by the Lord. Amen. As he uses apostles to inspire. Uh, he inspired them to write his words. Now it's interesting the word adakamas, A-D-O-K-I-M-O-S, adakamas. It's a word, the word, the letter A, we see the alpha before a word in Greek, the Greek language. 
and you read that letter, it, it's, like, it's, it's like anti. Like theism is the belief in God, but atheism is anti-belief in God. Gnosis is to have knowledge, but agnostic is to have no knowledge. Gnosis is to have knowledge. There's a, there's a you know, proper use of that word in when we're talking about heresies, when we're talking about the Gnostics, but I'm not talking, I'm just talking about the word Gnosis. Agnostic means no belief in God. I've talked to you about that Greek word storge. That means family love. And it says in the last days, men will be without storge. A is before the word storge. Here, the word dokamos you guys, please understand this. The, just the word dokamos without the A in front of it means to be approved. Means to be accepted. It's used of precious coins that have been tested and found to be approved. They were dokamos. Dokamos. In fact, Paul uses that word in 2 Timothy 2.15. Remember where he says to Timothy, as a young pastor, study to show yourself approved dokamas remember that verse study to show yourself approved a workman that needs not to be ashamed dokamas and that word is used a little bit more than the word adokamas which i said is used eight times so if you had some coins that were given to you and they were old coins and you weren't sure of their value and you could take them to somebody who would evaluate them and test them and they could tell you whether they were dokamas they passed the test they're legit or adokamas now adokamas can be used in a couple different ways regarding say coins or precious metals it can be used adokamas of that which is rejected because it's counterfeit it's adokamas or it could be rejected because it has not retained its value over time jesus warned about the salt that loses its savor and is only good to be just thrown out and trampled underfoot. A dokamas is a sorry word and it's used over and over again in the New Testament in a very chilling way. And he wants us to examine ourselves to see if we are... Now in the context of Corinthians, you read verse 21, he's talking about those who are continuing to rebel against God. Remember Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26? It says, If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Remember, Paul said that he, God wills that all would be saved and would come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen? That's a salvific term. And uh, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful looking for a fire and ignition which will consume or devour the adversaries of God. And he talks about those who trample. And in the context, there isn't somebody who just falls short of God's glory and, and, and has fallen into sin and repents like a prodigal son and gets right. It's a one who goes on to say tramples underfoot the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. He had been sanctified by that blood, but there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Why? Because that person tramples underfoot the blood of Christ. That person, it says, insults the Holy Spirit. You know, it's beyond even grieving the Holy Spirit. Now it's the point where they've turned against the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the context of the rebellion in Hebrews. Just read Hebrews 6, you know, putting them to open shame, rejecting him as Messiah. And that person uh, crucify, crucifies Christ afresh, Hebrews 6. I Meaning they continually, in their hearts and their minds, believe, you know, reject Christ. And while they're rejecting Christ and continuing to spit a pamp on him, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. There would have to be a change of heart before they could actually repent. Now it's interesting because that word adakamas is used in Hebrews chapter 6. We'll look at that later. The only other usage out of side of Paul's writings. But it's interesting, guys, because let's look at let's look now. This is going to be an eye-opening study for you, hopefully. Let's look at the different times that adakamas is used and we're, we're seeing right here it's used of those who are without christ because they're refusing to turn from their sins and paul says when he shows up i'm going to be mourning for you you know because he already said those who practice those things in chapter six of first corinthians 
He said, don't be deceived. Those who, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is serious stuff. Go to the first huge usage. Go to Romans chapter 1. You know where Paul talks about the antediluvians and he talks about how they didn't retain, even though they knew God, they didn't retain the knowledge of God. Uh, and they, you know, they, they rebelled and they worshiped the creation rather than the creator. Remember that? It says women had sexual relations with women and, and men with men, homosexuality and so forth. Uh, and he talks about how serious that the, how, you know, man just totally got perverted. And then in Romans chapter one, a little bit, you know, right after he says this in 24 through 27, look at what he says in verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a what? Depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. In the King James it says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The Greek word adakamas is translated depraved, in the New American Standard, reprobate in the King James. And it goes on to say in verse 29, be filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, their gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they do not only do the same, but... They also give healthy approval to those who practice them. Wow. And that's what the world's going to be like in the last days. Be like Sodom and Gomorrah. No mercy. No family love. People will be reprobates just like they were in Sodom. Remember, how how much mercy did they show the angels? They were in Lot's house. They had to blind them to get out of there. And it's going to become wicked. And it says from the, every corner of Sodom, they descended upon Lot's house, the young and the old. Everybody's brainwashed. And that was before they had television, internet, and radio. Can you imagine how easy it's going to be for Satan now? Pretty scary when you think about it. And it talks about how they had an adakamas or reprobate mind. Preachers used to call the wicked reprobates, you know, because you know, King James was more popular you know, in the English-speaking world years ago. So that was a popular term of the wicked, reprobates. But the Greek word means to fail the test, to be unacceptable, to be unapproved. Now, do you see how Paul uses this word? See that? He uses it of who? The lost. And he wants us to examine ourselves and make sure we're not on this list. Well, his list would have been 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 10 for those who are under the test, or 2 Corinthians 12, 21, right before verse 5. Those who are practicing rebellion and don't desire to repent and get right with God and refuse to get right with God. Go to, sec- go to Titus 1, 16. We see another usage by the Apostle Paul. Titus 1, 16. Now Paul is dealing with uh, false teachers here uh, who... Uh, Judaizers and what have you, and those who are involved in rebellion against God's law of love, His holy law, the the uh, law of liberty, the law of Christ, refuse to submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and are in rebellion. And in one sixteen, we read this, guys: They profess to know God. By their deeds, they what? Deny Him. So there's people that profess to know God, but by their deeds, they what? Deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. The King James has it this way. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. I'm going to the King James a little bit more often than I typically do, even though I quote most of my verses in King James because that's how I have many of my verses memorized. But because the King James consistently, almost consistently, uses the word reprobate when it translates the word adakamas, except a couple times. Six out of the eight times, the word adakamas. If you're reading the Greek New Testament, okay, I can read Greek, but I can't converse in Greek. 
And when you read the Greek New Testament, you see a dokamas eight times. Six of the eight times it is in, it is reprobate. Another, one time it's rejected, another time it's cast away in the King James. Okay? I wish they would have consistently translated it rejected or reprobate. Cast away will work when we get to it, as we'll see. But what do you have here in 116, guys? You have those who profess to know Him. Hey, I love the Lord. I love God. I praise the Lord. But they're what? That last word there, if you're using the NASB, which in my estimation is, is a better uh, translation than the King James. The King James has some big problems when it translates, for instance, the Holy Spirit. It calls an it a few different times throughout the New Testament. Holy Spirit is not an it. Amen? Amen. There's other problems I have with it as well, but it's a good translation in many other ways. And uh, it's, the, it's the New Testament letters that were inspired, amen, by the Holy Spirit, amen. And the translations help us, but the best thing to do, that's why we can go back and we can look at the Greek words like a dokamas and do a word study like we're doing this evening. And here we see in 116, they profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. It's translated worthless right there. Worthless. By the way, we're seeing that Paul consistently is using this word of those who are what? Lost. In Romans 1, even though they knew God, they didn't retain the knowledge of God, and they were reprobate. Here they profess in the Lord, but by their works they deny Him. They are reprobate. Okay? If somebody goes to Blessed Hope Chapel and they seem like they love God and they talk about the Lord and they profess to know Him, but in their private life, they're, you know, you know robbing banks and they're, you know, visiting prostitutes and they're, uh, you know, snorting coke and shooting heroin. They profess, no, but their works, they deny Him. They're, they're, they're reprobate. You know, they need to repent and get right with Jesus, have godly fear and, and, and turn to the Lord. Now, we see it again, this word, again, in 2 Timothy 3.8. Go to 2 Timothy, back up just... One book, 2 Timothy 3.8, it talks about the last days. And it talks about how terrible times will come in the last days. Remember that passage? And it talks about those who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. What are we seeing consistently with some of the times this word is used? They had the knowledge of God, yet they rejected it. They became reprobate. They professed to know Him, but by their works they deny Him. Reprobate. 2 Timothy 3.5. What does it say? Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Now look at verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 8. Just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses. These were the two magicians in Moses' court that did counterfeit miracles. Just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of what? Depraved mind, rejected. Now it's not depraved right there. It's translated rejected. Rejected, it says, rejected in regard to the faith. So these are people who oppose the truth of the gospel, oppose the truth of the Lord. And the context is they can even have a form of godliness, but deny its power. And they are, it says at the end of verse 8, rejected, the Greek word is a dokamos, in regard to the faith. Do you see that Paul is consistently using this of who? The lost. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, he warns the church at Corinth, which was filled with saved people and some lost people who thought they were saved, to examine themselves to make sure that they are in the faith and that Christ is in you unless you are a dokamas. Are you seeing the consistency of Paul's usage of this word? Amen. And to me, I'm sorry. And I don't, I'm not really sorry. I mean, but this is what Bible studies should be about, man. This, I wish this stuff was being taught throughout the radio airways on Christian television so Christians could make sure they're saved. So they don't go into eternity lost and separated from God under eternal torment in the lake of fire forever and ever because they never stopped and said, man, I've had several people come to me through the years and say, thank God we get emails this way that people that have come to me from the church that have said, thank God, when I started coming to Blessed Hope, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize I did, didn't really know Jesus. And then I realized what it meant to become a Christian and, and to truly turn to Him. 
and repent and, and, and have Him as my Lord and Savior. Several people, several people have come to me through the years and said, man, I first started coming to Blessed Hope. I didn't realize I was lost. I never really committed my life to Christ. I just thought going to church made me a Christian. Or I've heard those kinds of things all, over and over again. And here we see another usage. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 4. The author of Hebrews, which is ultimately the Lord, that'll end any dispute, amen? We know who wrote it. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, and he uses this as a salvific term in chapter 10, says after they were enlightened, they talks about how they suffered and they accepted the seizure of their property joyfully because they know they have a home in heaven, that ab- abiding hope in heaven, a home in heaven. So he's, he uses that term enlightened for believers in the book of Hebrews. And have tasted of the heavenly gift. Heavenly gift is Jesus. Tasted doesn't just mean to nibble. The word tasted is used early in Hebrews chapter 2 of Jesus tasting death for everyone. Do you think Jesus just nibbled death or does it mean he experienced it? He experienced death. These are, this, it's a metaphor for experiencing Jesus. Having experience with him, the heavenly gift. And have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for partakers in Hebrews chapter 3 is used to describe believers who are holy brethren. Verse 1, partakers of the heavenly calling. Metekos. And verse 5, and have tasted of the good word of God. God bless you. Experienced the word of God. Again, in 1 Peter, uh, Peter talks about those who have tasted that the word of God is good and have become newborn babes. And have tasted the good word of God. And the powers of the age to come. They experience the power of Christ coming. A ta- they've tasted it to a degree that he's going to return in the future. And then verse 6, have what? And then have what? Fallen away. Don't let anybody tell you that a Christian cannot fall away. By the way, this says they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. Do non-believers receive the Holy Spirit? No, it says in Acts chapter 5, I believe verse 32, that he gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him, okay? Jesus said the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Paul said the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit. These are actual partakers of the Holy Spirit. And then have what? Fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance. By the way, in my Bible, I have the word again circled. I have a lot of different Bibles, and it's circled in this one. Again means a second time. So some will say, oh, they never truly repented of their sins. What? That contradicts what the Word of God says. Thus saith the Scripture. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. I mean, they had earlier in their walk before they what? Fell away. You're not given the Holy Spirit until you repent and believe. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Why is it impossible to renew these folks to repentance since? It's talking about the condition. This is the reason why they crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Crucify to themselves is in the present tense. They're continually coming against Jesus. They become antichrist. And if, you're, if you become an antichrist and you dig your feet in the ground and you refuse to, well, you can't come to repentance in that state, amen? Now James 5, 19 and 20 says, Brethren, if any of you turn away from the truth and one brings him back, he'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. People can be brought back, but not if they're sticking their feet in the ground and refuse to come back. And crucifying Christ are fresh. In Romans chapter 11, it talks about these natural branches were broken off from the salvation tree. But it says God is able to what? Graft them in again if they do not continue in unbelief. That's the question. Because salvation is by grace through what? Faith. And we're not talking about whether someone is good enough to be a Christian. What we're talking about, brothers and sisters, is whether or not you have saving faith. Amen? The just shall live by faith. But if he draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Examine yourself, Paul says, to see if you are in the faith. Amen? If you're truly trusting Jesus. Because you can have the faith of a demon. The Bible says the demons believe. And they shudder. They're freaked out. They're not saved. That faith won't save them, James says. 
Remember the demons that Jesus confronts legion, you know? They're, to- they're like, oh, they're freaked out. They say, don't send us to be tormented before our time. Jesus, they believe, man. Demons believe. They're like, they know what's up. Okay? They want to lead others to hell. So the kind of faith, that saving faith, is not just mental assent to believe in your head like a demon that Jesus is Lord. In Matthew 7, when many say, Lord, Lord, right? Remember that? Many will say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me. They believed that Jesus was Lord, right? But they had a fundamental problem. They refused to repent, as we'll see a little bit later. This is actually a pretty short study. It won't be much longer, but keep your, there's some pretty heavy things, so keep your, your spiritual belt on. Look at verse uh, 7. They crucified themselves, verse 6, at the end, Son of God, and put him to open shame. For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, remember the parable of the sower? And brings forth vegetation useful to those whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. Remember the parable of the sower? Three out of the four sprung up to life. One never came to life. One never had life because the birds took the seed before it germinated. The three others had life, but two died. It's a picture of spiritual death. And one persevered because it held fast to the word Jesus said. Verse 8. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is what? Worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Wow. King James, but that which bears thorns and briars is rejected. Right here it's translated worthless. NASB translates this word a couple times, worthless. And it, it, New America, or King James rejected. Remember I said the King James, out of the eight times, six of the times it's reprobate. One time it's rejected, which is here. And other, one other time it's cast away. Interesting what passage it's translated. Cast away. But notice here, this is for, these are for those who were once enlightened, who once tasted Jesus, experienced Jesus, who once had received the Holy Spirit, who had repented of their sins, but refused to come back to repentance. And they're rejected, adakamas. And their end is to what? The end of verse 8 is to be what? Burned, which fits chapter 10. Those who continue to sin or sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth they no longer remain sacrificed for sins, but a certain fearful looking of fire indignation which will consume the adversary. There's a being burned again. Okay. Serious stuff, guys. Serious stuff. And I believe because we get serious and we, we really look at the Word, it should have a serious effect on our lives, amen? That I want to be right with God. I don't want to play around with Christianity, you know? I don't want to look at the Bible as some kind of self-help book to improve my life a little bit. I want God to radically change me. I want to make sure I'm born again and I know Jesus, amen? And if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature, amen? All things have passed away, all things have become new. I want to make sure I'm a new creation in Jesus. I want to make sure I'm following him, I'm serious about obedience to him. And not saved by my obedience to him, but saved by his grace through what he did on the cross, but truly saved because I'm truly looking to him and truly trusting him and I truly love him. Amen? Now, we've looked at seven of the eight usages. We looked at Romans one, uh, Romans one twenty eight. We looked at uh, Titus one sixteen. We looked at 2 Timothy 3.8. We looked at Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 8. We looked at three usages in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 13, 5, 6, and 7. One other usage. And when you look at this last usage I'm showing you, it's the last time it's found. It's a hair razor. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The Apostle Paul writes, Verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you, do, that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. Now look at verse 27. But I discipline my body. And I make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself would not be a dakamas. 
rejected, reprobate, failed the test. In fact, NASB has disqualified. Now, the King James has castaway. Six times it has reprobate, one time it has rejected. Here it has castaway. The NASB has disqualified. I think castaway and disqualified work because the idea is not being approved, not being accepted, not passing the test. And disqualified fits here in the NASB because Paul was, was Paul saved by the way? Absolutely. Don't say, well, you can't become a docomos if you were saved. You would never really fall away. We just saw from Hebrews 6 that that's not true. Come on, we got to accept what the word of God says. And here Paul's talking about being in a race. Not if, well, Paul never really was in the race. Untrue. And becoming disqualified. A.T. Robertson, the foremost American Greek scholar ever. Uh, dead now. Baptist guy. He says, and I have his word studies in the Greek. It's like six volumes. It's really cool. And he, he says in this passage right here of Adakamas, he says, if Paul was concerned, if Paul was concerned, about becoming a docomos. How much more should we all be concerned? The, he, said, the, he says the Apostle Paul, he, just, he builds him up. He says, if, if this man was concerned about being cast away, how much more should we be concerned? Now, you know what happens when you get to a lot of commentaries that have a cheap understanding of grace and easy believism and don't believe you if you, they believe if you fall away, you know, you're still saved. They say, oh, Paul was just worried about being a cracked pot. A cracked pot that was kind of set aside on the shelf and just not used as much. Is that what the word adakamas means? A cracked pot, guys? That's still used and on God's shelf? And No, we saw that every time that word is used, and I've looked at every usage of it now, every time Paul uses this of something that you don't want to be, it's of what? Something you, throw in the trash. something you throw in the trash. Yeah. Something that's rejected. Something that's reprobate. Something that's worthless. Something that's not approved. Something that's not accepted. And by the way, Paul's usage of this word is unmistakable. Because look at the next verse. Remember, there's no chapter breaks. Chapter 10, verse 1. But there's no chapter breaks in the original letter. Moreover, if you have the King James... Or verse 10, for, it's a conjunction. He's connecting it to the last thought he gave. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. He's highlighting all these wonderful experiences that the Jews had after the Passover experience. And all drank the same spiritual drink, verse 4. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And the rock was who? Christ. He's saying, hey, I'm running this race. I'm not shadow boxing. I'm boxing to get the knockout blow. And I'm continuing to run the race with self-discipline. So after I preached the gospel to others and told them how to be saved, I myself would have become disqualified. Moreover, or for, I do not want you to be unaware. Think about the history of God's people, how they were saved out of Egypt, as Jude says, and later destroyed many of them. And here he says, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us. They were examples for us. We're supposed to draw a line from them to us, from us to them and say, hey, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't turn away. Don't think, hey, I could just rebel against God. These happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters. Why? Revelation 21 8 says that idolaters go to the lake of fire. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and sit up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Paul warns that the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. A little bit later in this, earlier in this letter, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, where he says, don't be deceived, adulterers, fornicators, effeminate, homosexuals won't inherit the kingdom of God. doesn't mean to just be put on a shelf and not used as much by God. It means to be utterly rejected and not inherit the kingdom. Be not deceived. 
Verse 9, nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happen to them as what? An example. Paul, you're being repetitious. Paul, why are you repeating yourself? You already told us that they were examples because he wants us to get it through our heads, guys. Now these things happen to them as an example. And they were written down, or they were written for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Wow. Paul thought he stood, but he continued to stand. He beat his body down. He didn't want to get off track and begin chasing evil things. He wanted to finish his race so he would not become a dokamas. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. He's warning those who stand, like himself, to flee idolatry. Worshipping the false god instead of the true god. This is, these are heavy warnings. You cannot tell me when Paul says that he beats his body down so he doesn't become a dokamas, that it means anything less than the way he used the word everywhere else. He used it consistently this way. In the context of 1 Corinthians, he doesn't want to become a fornicator. He said earlier in the book, chapter 6, don't be deceived, they won't inherit the kingdom. This is a salvific issue. If you rebel against the Lord, you refuse to repent. It's serious stuff. It's serious stuff. Go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And thank the Lord that He's faithful. Amen? There's no temptation that's taken us that's not common to men. Other people go through exactly what you've gone through, believe it or not, Millions of times, maybe over, at least thousands and thousands. But with the temptation, God's faithful. He'll give you a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Amen? Don't ever say, oh, God's not going to be there for me. Oh, for some reason, God wouldn't give me the strength. God's not partial, he says. Don't accuse him of being partial. He loves you. He wants you to succeed. That's why these warnings are here, because he loves us. He wants us to stay on track. He wants us to finish the race. He's not a big, mean God thinking, man, I just hope they get off so I can swat them down. No, he's like, he loves us. doesn't will that any would perish, right? has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants you on that road. That's why he gives you these warnings, to stay on the straight and narrow. Amen? Amen. It's a good thing. And that's why I warn you as such, because I love you. I know the Lord loves you. And that's why these scriptures are here. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Amen? That's awesome. First John chapter 3. Verse 7, Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin, verse 8, is of who? The devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God, it's in the perfect tense, means no one who is born of God and continues to be born of God, remains born of God, practices sin. Because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. If you are continuing to trust Jesus, right? He's the object of your faith. His word is abiding in you. You're not going to be practicing sin. So let's go to where we started. We, well, we started Second Corinthians chapter 13, but I, the first scripture I mentioned was Matthew chapter 7. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount after he gives them this wonderful sermon. And then in chapter 7, he warns them in verses 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. And he warns about false prophets 
who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Because right before these two gates, the broad one that leads to destruction, the, white, the narrow one that leads to life, there's false prophets that say, hey, come in this broad one. Look, it looks good. And it's paid with, you know, words of grace and some promise of salvation and what have you. I wish I had time to get into the false prophets. We've studied them extensively uh, numerous times. So let's cut right to uh, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the what? The will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Did you see that? It's not just believing that Jesus is Lord in your mind. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Certainly, obviously, they're calling Jesus Lord, but their hearts, not in their hearts, they're not. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. It's those who are actually doing the Father's will. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? There it is again. You who what? Practice lawlessness. Brothers and sisters, that word practice, you see that again? We've seen that earlier. If you're saying, man, I'm listening to this message, but I'm far from perfect, Joe, and I, I'm seeking to grow in the Lord. I love Him, and I'm, I'm in the faith, but, you know, I, I stumble and I struggle at times. We're talking about following the Lord and then struggling at times. Welcome to everybody's life. Nobody's perfect. James says we all stumble in many ways. No one's perfect. But we're talking about practicing lawlessness here. Do you understand the difference? That's one who makes a habit of rebelling against the Lord but says his name, but their hearts are far from him. They're in rebellion to God. If you are trusting the Lord and you love Jesus and, and he's first in your life, and, and you, but you fall short of his glory, but you're, you're, you seek to go forward to the Lord, and when you fall short, you're, 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 your heart sad, and you say, Lord, have mercy on me, make me stronger, and you, and, and you confess your sins, and you continue to seek to follow. And the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Amen. And 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as He's the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen? You're continually being cleansed if you are in the faith. But you can't be in the faith. Examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Christ is in you unless you are a dakamas. You cannot be in the faith if you're in rebellion to Him. Why? Nothing to do with obeying Him. Saying, hey, I love Him with my mouth, but you're living a lifestyle that's wicked. You gotta, gotta check it out. You gotta examine yourself. First John, or James chapter 2 says faith without works is what? Dead. That's a demon faith. There's no real works there. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever what? Believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But did you ever see John? We love to quote John 3.16. It's a beautiful verse. But, and don't, don't turn, you don't have to turn here because I want to keep reading Matthew as well. But you can, if you keep your finger in Matthew, just look at John 3.36 real quick. John 3.36. Pretty interesting. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not, what? Obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Do you read that? You hear that? Wow. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. So if you're, just, if you're rejecting Jesus and refusing to obey him, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and do not the things I say? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my words. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Acts 5.32 is a scripture I mentioned earlier. The Holy Spirit who God has given to those who obey him. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 talks about how God will be dealing out retribution at Christ's second coming to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Are you looking to Jesus for salvation? That's obedience to Him. Looking to Him as your Lord and Savior. Trusting in Him as your Lord and Savior. Back to Matthew 7. He calls them workers or practice, they're practicing lawlessness. Now look at this, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the, blood, and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. 
Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. Then the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and the slammed against the house, that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Wow. Now what did Jesus say right when he went into that illustration of the two foundations? Verse 24, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. Did you catch that? If you hear Jesus' words, you say, I'm a Christian, but you don't act on His words, you're going to be like a foolish man who's built your life in the sand, and when the storms come, man, you're wiped out, man. James chapter 1 says, Be doers the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. King James again, that's how I've that memorized. <laughs> you hear that? Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. There are millions of professing Christians in the world and many in the United States, many of those millions who profess to know him, but by their works they deny him and are adakamas, Titus 1.16 we already looked at. Jesus said in John 8.51, He that keeps my word, he that keeps my word will never see death. It's not about physical death. We all die physically, unless the rapture comes first. He's talking about spiritual death. There are many who profess to know him, but they never have known him. Depart from me, I, I, I don't know you, right? I never knew you. There are many that profess to be Christians who we never knew. Some quote that and say, look, Anybody who doesn't know him, never knew him. No, he's just talking about a bunch of false prophets there, if you read the context, uh, who, who never knew him. It's a strong expression of disowning them. But Jesus talks about the ten virgins. They all had oil at first, if you read that carefully in chapter 25 of Matthew. They all had oil. They all had lamps. The lamp's a picture of God's word. It's a lamp to my feet, light to my path. The oil speaks of the Holy Spirit. We read in Hebrews 6, even though they had received the Holy Spirit, yet they fell asleep. There was no more oil for five of them. And he didn't say, I never knew you. He said, he said, he wouldn't answer when they knocked. It's too late. He said, I don't know you. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, it says of those after coming to know Jesus, the Greek word is epinosis there, experiential knowledge it says and they, it talks about how they fall away and be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it to have you know turned from the holy commandment delivered to them and he's warning believers in that book so there's those who have never known him there's others who says i don't know you there's others second peter chapter 2 20 through 22 who knew him and then fell away that would also be Hebrews 6 now you guys I know, I know, I'm preaching to the choir a lot tonight. A lot, a lot of saved people that love Jesus here. But our messages go far and wide. And we're hoping, and I'm hoping, anybody that might be here who doesn't really, hasn't really committed themselves to Jesus, to know Him as Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior would make sure you have. Make sure you do. Or if you're listening and you don't know me personally, know that I love you, know that Jesus loves you, can you honestly say, when you look to the Lord, you look at His Word, that you're seeking Jesus, that you're putting your trust in Him? Can you examine yourself and say, I'm in the faith, I'm not in rebellion to Him, I'm seeking Him. You can't seek Him and be in rebellion to Him at the same time. They're totally mutually exclusive concepts. Do you understand? If you're in the faith, that means you're looking to Jesus the author and the perfecter of your faith. Amen? If you're just listening because somebody else is making you listen to this and you really don't want anything to do with Jesus, you need to know Jesus before it's too late because you're going to go into a Christless eternity forever and ever. And there's going to be no rest day and night, Jesus revealed in Revelation chapter 14. The smoke of your torment will go up forever and ever. There will be no rest day and night forever and ever. And you'll eternally regret it. It'll be like a worm you know, devour you forever because it says a worm never dies. It'll bug you for eternity. And maybe there's going to be a physicality to that as well. There's definitely going to be a physicality to the punishment because we'll have resurrected bodies. And so will those who are like a fire. 
Make sure you get right with Jesus if you haven't done that yet. If you say, hey, I love Jesus. He is my Lord and Savior. I've been struggling lately, but He is first in my life. But I, I need to grow more. Guess what? The Bible talks about those who are babes in Christ, right? 1 Corinthians 3. Hebrews chapter 5. He warns about those who are babes who ought to be teaching, and, but, but they're, they're still on milk. And that's why He warns them in the next chapter to watch out so they don't fall away because you're in a dangerous position. You need to grow in the Lord. Amen? If you're a babe. But if you're like, man, you know what? I'm not super Christian. I'm not walking as strong as I am. But I, 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 I want to. But you know what? I love Jesus. And you're a babe in Jesus? Well, you're saved if you're a baby. If you're a baby, you're part of the family. But I encourage you to grow. Amen? And praise God. Being the Word together with us, like we are now, is a good thing. But you know how you really move from babyhood to spiritual adolescence? My son was the last of my three kids that had to move through adolescence. And when he became a teenager, he started feeding himself. He learned to use the microwave even before he became a teenager, I'm happy to say. You know? But we need to always be fed milk and meat. And the Bible does I mean, iron sharpens iron. You know, I still get taught. We all still get taught by the Word. But you also need to feed yourself God's Word. Amen? That's how you know you're not a baby anymore. You, you don't just say, Mama, Dada, feed me. You're like, what's God's word say today? You know, I'm hungry. And you get the food out yourself. Amen? So make sure you're growing. Make, ins- make sure you're breaking open God's word on your own too. Amen? And then you graduate to spiritual fatherhood. That means when you're bringing people in the kingdom, you're sharing Jesus with them. Amen? And you're bringing new converts. Your, your people are coming. Paul talked about how he became the father of of those who he brought to Christ. So we're all at different stages in our growth. If you follow in Jesus and you're like, man, I just wish I was stronger, this doesn't apply to you if you're following Jesus. If you're putting your trust in him, if he's your Lord and Savior, it only applies in this way. Examine yourself to make sure you stay in the faith. Amen? And it applies to you to help others who you know who say they're believers, but they're getting drunk. They're chasing, you know, their their idol is sexuality, sexual perversion, material things, things of that nature. Jesus has to be first, amen? Let's keep Jesus first. Every once in a while I do a message like this because guess what? I think it's important. I'm going to preach it this way until I'm dead. And I told the Lord a long time ago, I'm never compromised, and I've been preaching at this church for 26 years. And if you look at what I preached 26 years ago, it's very similar because God's word doesn't change. Amen? Amen? The message doesn't change. Oh, I've got older. have a little bit less hair. You know, uh, some of it's a little grayer. But man, God's word never changes. Amen? And I'm going to go to the grave by the grace of God. Take heed when you stand, lest you fall. By the grace of God, let's all go to the grave confessing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. No turning back. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We praise you, Lord God, for vouchsafing your holy word to us, Father. Father, your word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the good news of the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again and conquered death. I pray if anybody's listening to my voice that they would understand that we're saved by grace, what he did on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, giving himself for us, shedding his blood for us, a precious gospel. We're saved through his gospel. We're saved through his shed blood. By grace, we are saved, Paul said, through faith, that not of ourselves the gift of God, not of works as anyone should boast. Lord, we know it's by faith, but we know many will have a false faith in the end. May we have genuine faith. And may we examine ourselves, as Paul said, to see and make sure that we're in the faith.